You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Today we're joined with special guest Jamie Lane, who is SVP of Analytics at AirDNA. And we're going to be discussing trends and different data points within the short term rental space. So if you're involved in short term rentals currently, you're already invested, or you're considering jumping into the game, this is going to be an episode you certainly want to pay attention to. Maybe even go ahead, play it back, share it with a friend, get them to help out. If they're exploring short term rentals, they're going to want to hear it too. Jamie, uh, thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. Would you be able to give us a little information on your background and how you got involved in short term rentals? Yeah, so I've been involved in the travel and tourism industry since 2010. I started as an analyst for a hotel research company. Uh, spent 10 years there as an economist, broadly for the hotel industry. And we really wanted to understand how short-term rentals were impacting hotels. And that was the, sort of the first sort of question that led me to start digging into short-term rental performance data. Uh, actually became one of the first clients of AirDNA back in 2015, sort of getting access to their data, digging into it. And fast forward to 2020, joined AirDNA as their uh, SVP of analytics and get to sort of dig into the data, sort of unearth the trends that are happening within the industry. And it sort of gets me excited to help people understand I mean, what's happening and how they should adjust their investment strategies based on those trends that we're seeing. That's amazing. A much needed uh, thing in this space for sure. I, I know you're you're with Air DNA. For those who may not know, um, what is Air DNA and what does it help short-term rentals do? Before we kind of just dive into the meat of everything. Yeah. So we are a data analytics company. Uh, we track the performance of more than 10 million short-term rentals around the world. And how many nights are they getting booked? At what rate are they getting booked at? How much revenue are they earning over time? Uh, and we've been tracking industry performance over the past nine years. So you can get a sense for any property out there, what it's actually earning. And then as you sort of dig into new investments, we have tools to let you understand on what that investment could earn as a short-term rental. And then subsequently, then how you should price that rental, what does forward demand look like, uh, all sorts of things to help you optimize your listing once you once you have it in-house. Gotcha, gotcha. Definitely a very powerful platform. I believe Brandon, I think he mentioned before the show that he actually found his short-term rental via AirDNA. So that was that was interesting to note. Yeah, I used uh, I used AirDNA to do the due diligence on it. So I was trying to figure out how much it could earn. So back in uh, 2021. So yeah, love the platform. Awesome. So what recent trends are you seeing in the short-term rental market? Anything uh, broad or, or overarching? Yeah, there's a couple broad trends. Some of those broad trends sort of getting, I mean, as we've seen, um, maybe overemphasized in the press. But we have seen now uh, 18 consecutive months of declining occupancies in the industry. So we had this really weird dynamic that happened during the pandemic of all of a sudden travel stopped. And we clearly saw that in our data. When that travel stopped, we also saw a massive amount of supply actually come out of uh, the industry. So a combination of urban rentals that essentially converted to long-term rentals. And then in vacation rental markets, people that had second homes all of a sudden wanted to start using those second homes because they had the ability to live and work anywhere. Then we had demand come back astronomically quick from like standstill to fully recovered by April 2021. We did not have the supply to support that much demand, which sent occupancy levels to record highs. And 2021 will go down and in the history books as sort of in record high occupancy levels. Now we've had supply start to come back. We're at about 25, 30% now higher supply than pre-COVID levels. And that has meant occupancy levels have been coming down. Not alarmingly slow. We're still well above 2019 levels of occupancy, but we're sort of coming off of those highs. And it's gotten a whole lot more competitive in the short-term rental space to find and attract guests to your units. And with that competitiveness, now we're seeing some I mean, weakness on pricing power too, sort of coming off of some of the really strong growth that we saw in 2021 and 2022. So a lot of changing dynamics happening in the space right now. 
Yeah, I've actually noticed that with my own rental in 2021 and 2022. That was my first two years of ownership. It was really simple to uh, <laughs> to gain full occupancy during the peak season. And this year, I actually had to work for it a little bit. So <laughs> Luckily, I'm in a pretty good location, so I don't have to work too hard. But I did have to work, and I was like, I don't know, man. This is not as passive as the Twitter gurus tell you that it is. <laughs> Um, so my question to you is, is there like a general metric that we could look at that tells us if we're in a more normalized market or not? Like, how did you, you said that you, you knew that travel had stopped and that occupancy rates are coming back down. Like, how do you know when we're in a normal market? What does that look like? Yeah. So in studying the travel space and, and specifically a hotel and short-term rental space for the past and going on 13 years now, something that I sort of learned about occupancy is that it it varies around a mean. So average occupancy over time is going to be pretty steady. And for the short-term rental industry as a whole, it averages out at about 55, 56%. And if you look at it over the long run for the hotel industry, it averages out about 58, 59%. So they, they do a bit better at sort of revenue managing, get people in during the off season. But so that average, and we're at the average in around 2018, 2019, we're going to get back there as an industry more than likely over the next two to three years. You can look at each market and get a sense of what their average was in 2018, 2019, where we're at now, and maybe where it's going to normalize at. I do see that we're getting better at pricing our units and we maybe not going to get down to an as low as 2018, 2019, but the sort of the highs of 2021 and 2022 are, were never sustainable just because the profit opportunity that was out there. And we saw, and it's a metric we track investability. Uh, we saw record investability. So the average earnings divided by the average purchase price that you could earn and sort of reached astronomical <laughs> levels. That's why the Twitter gurus were maybe saying why it was so easy. Cause you just look at, look at those metrics and it's like, you, you can literally buy everything, anything, uh, and it's going to turn a profit right now. And, and that's in a lot of ways why we do show such a long time series of data in our platform is so you can get a sense of what, what is more normalized. You can go back and see what was happening in 2021, 2022. You can go back and see what was happening in 2018, 2019, and get a sense of maybe what what's a more equilibrium occupancy to expect long term. So if I hear you correctly, we still have a ways to go before we reach that like equilibrium threshold. So does that mean that we should expect to see more weakness in demand over the next 12 to 24 months? I would say more of the same in terms of weakness. We're seeing a decline right now of about 2% year over year in terms of occupancy. Our outlook for the year ahead is for it to decline by about another 2%. And then we sort of stabilize. Okay. Uh, so we're expecting 2024 to be a maybe the first normal year in a long <laughs> time. And that then gives us something to start building off of where in some markets, I'll start underwriting increases in occupancies going forward, depending on what's happening and sort of the supply demand makeup, how much supply is actually coming in. Got it. So that means that I'm going to work a little bit harder next year. <laughs> to, to <get> <laughs> 2024 is going to be probably one of the hardest years that we've seen in the past. Oh, no. All right. Well, three. at least at least you're telling me now so that I can yeah. get a head start. I appreciate right. that. If you're not paying attention to your pacing and your pricing, I start doing that now because it, it's yeah. not going to get easier. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Um, now, you mentioned investability. Was that the right term? Yep. So talk to us about that metric and why is it important? Yeah. It may be a word I'm making up. I'm, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but it, it is a metric that I look at. And so how I define investability and how we define it in our platform is we look at the average earnings, average annual earnings for a property over time over the past year and look at that relative to the average purchase price for a new home. Um, and we can do that averages for the overall US. We can do it at a market level. We can do it at a submarket level. And uh, you could do it for properties you're actually looking at. And that ratio gives you a relative sense of 
okay, and that revenue that I'm going to earn relative to the purchase price. So a long-term average of that is about like 11%. That increased in 15, 16% in terms of that investability or another way you could talk about is yield. And now that's decreasing and decrease and it's sort of well below we were at even uh, in 2018, 2019. So all rolled up into that is one, what is the average occupancy and ADR that you can earn going into the revenue piece? And then on the home side, you've got home values. So what can you, you can actually buy it at? And then inherently in there is what are the interest rates? So, uh, and we're at really elevated home values, really high interest rates. We're sort of, and still at the peak or plateauing at the peak in terms of revenues being earned by short-term rentals. Uh, we're about 30% higher on average than we were prior to the pandemic. And we've sort of been maintaining there. We've we've gone down by about a percent over the past 18 months. Fortunately, the increases in ADRs, the average rates that we've been getting, have been offsetting some of the declines in occupancy. So we've sort of been maintaining the revenues that we're, we've sort of been getting. But home values and interest rates have sort of been eating into the investability for new investments. So do we expect the investability metric to continue to trend downward? Unfortunately, for investors, home values, and while they came down a bit over the past year, they're maintaining where they've sort of been at. And we don't expect the Fed to be cutting interest rates anytime soon. We may see the sort of the spread between the sort of 30-year fixed interest rate that you can get on a loan and the sort of 10-year treasury and come down a bit, but sort of forecast for I mean, interest rates are for them to stay higher for longer. Uh, so unless we see I mean, a big uptick in the revenues that can be earned in short-term rentals, sort of outpace what we're expecting, which we're expecting another year of essentially flat revenues, we expect this low investability to sort of be around for at least the next 12 to 18 months. And then that'll probably shake some people out of the market. And then the cycle just continues, right? It re- kind of resets and moves on. Yeah, we're, we're already seeing it show up in terms of amount of supply coming in. So last year at the peak, we we're seeing a 25% year-over-year increase in new supply uh, or in terms of overall inventory. So that's a massive amount of new supply coming into the short-term rental space. That's why occupancies were coming down. We're actually seeing and continue to see more people staying in short-term rentals than ever before. We are hitting records in terms of demand and the number of people renting homes in the U.S. And we're continuing to break those this year compared to last year and prior years. It's just that supply growth that's sort of causing the decline in occupancy. So our slowing supply growth is actually great for the existing operators out there because you're seeing less new competition come in and we expect that to continue. It's just that it's still going up like 12% year over year. There's some markets where it's still going up 20, 25%. So it's really market dependent, but we do expect that to slow even further next year. So less than 10% growth in supply, probably about five to 8% growth in demand. Uh, which means a bit slower or weaker occupancy. But then that's when we expect maybe a turn, interest rates to start to come down, revenues to start to increase again. And that's when the investability metric we think will turn towards investors again and start to look more attractive. That makes sense. So you mentioned ADR Mm -hmm. earlier. Can you explain what that is for everybody? Yeah, so that's average daily rates. So this is the average rate that a guest is paying for short-term rental, and we track it at the national level, we track it at a market level, and uh, where it's most important to look at is as a and for an investor or for a host is at a comp set level. So how is your comp set pricing their rentals? How does that compare to you? And if you're not getting the sort of demand you would expect, not getting the bookings you would expect of tracking, okay, how is my competition pricing? their rental, so the average daily rate out into the future, how am I pricing my rental, and then seeing the demand that they're getting. There's a lot of times it could be, I may be pricing my unit like 5% higher than my competition. They're getting booked at 80%. I'm getting booked at 60%. I could make a relatively small change on price 
and see a relatively big impact on bookings. And that's Mm -hmm. where it gets into monitoring sort of ADRs, monitoring the pricing trends in my market, in my neighborhood can really impact the bookings that are getting in my property. How do you calculate ADR? Like, is that Uh, that a metric where it's based on actual bookings or is it just if the property is available? Yeah, so it's the total revenue divided by the total bookings. Got and it. then the sort of other sort of standard industry metric that's out there is RevPAR. So revenue per available rental. And that looks at total nights available and the revenue. So how much revenue did I earn? How many nights did I actually make my unit available? Uh, and then so that you look at that for average out over an entire year, that's going to get to your your revenue for the year. So for RevPAR, does that ever get distorted if somebody just like, leaves their unit available 365 days but like i'm thinking about like beach towns right yep. we all leave our rental available for 365 days but reality is we get like 20 weeks of strong bookings and then random ones here and there so how does the rev part kind of like or does it even matter because i yeah, guess it's just it, market it, by market it, it does matter and it plays into our definition of, of RevPAR. So we only count a unit as available when calculating occupancy in RevPAR if it had at least one night booked over the past month. Oh, so okay. if you're not actively getting bookings in that unit, we're not going to count it as available. So it would reduce the number of nights available in the off season and show you as fully available during the during the sort of peak season, shoulder seasons, when you may be, not be getting fully booked, but you're, and if you're actively managing your rate, actively trying to get people in your your unit, you're going to get at least one booking throughout that month and your unit would stay active in terms of calculating RevPAR. Okay, that's good. I did not know that. So thanks for sharing that. Since we're talking about RevPAR, uh, you responded to a tweet. This is actually the reason that we reached out to you. I wanted to get you on this podcast. You responded to a tweet, I think it was back in June, yeah. about RevPAR dropping 40%. Because yeah. on, on Twitter, is that in, and I know that you like you do a really good job kind of bringing the data to the conversation, but on Twitter, there's this group of people that every week are saying that the short-term rental market collapse is finally here and everybody's going to lose their shirts. And then everybody tags you and then you come in with data. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you, you did a really good job replying to this. So I wanted to ask you about it. So there's a tweet that said that the revenues are down, RevPAR is down 50%. And I think it was coming from all the rooms, which I'd never heard of before this week. But but basically looking at some major markets and saying that the percentage drop was anywhere between like 40 to 50%. And you came in and you said, that's not actually happening. So can you kind of just give us a little bit of context there? Why are people thinking this, number one? Yep. Uh, like, what are they looking at that's making them come to this conclusion? I always like to like ask that. Like, we, we do a lot of tax, right? And so we, we see a lot of bad tax advice. Mm-hmm. And when my research team, my, my, uh, all my employees see that, we'll like talk about it internally. I always ask, but take their perspective. Why are they even saying this in the first place? Like, what are they seeing that like we're not understanding or, or, or maybe they're not seeing the full picture? So I guess. Explain the context. Like, what are they saying, and why is it incorrect? Yep. So, and that tweet and that group of people that you mentioned, I sort of bucket into this group called the housing doomers. They're always tweeting about how the housing market is on the uh, brink of collapse and it's coming. And um, in one day, they'll be right. Right. <laughs> one day. One day they'll they'll be right, or or they won't. Like housing oh, collapses won't. don't don't happen that often. And we yeah. have seen one during our recent lifetime, but that is not a, a typical thing to happen to see and peaked housing declines like, like we did and, and massive foreclosures. Uh, so the premise of this tweet was that short-term rentals revenues were collapsing and that there was going to be a flood of short-term rental owners now selling their homes. And that was going to cause a collapse bigger than we'd seen in the subcrime housing crisis of the housing market. So there's a couple different premises there that <laughs> I mean, we could try to debunk, but I sort of went after the ones that are the one that I look at every day of how much revenues are homes earning and how many listings are there out there 
And he called out that essentially that RevPars or revenue per available listing was collapsing down 50%. That's a data point I literally look at every day. So I just went into our data to see if there was any way that we could manipulate it to make that true. And we talked about I mean, revenues, RevPars are actually down. And when you look at the markets that he called out where it was averaging 40%, and I could get to it being down 4%. Yes, it's down, but it's not down 10x that. So I wanted to call that out and I made it very clear that and I wasn't sure if it was a sort of bad analysis that he had done on the data. And so and being tax guys, you guys, and you can just make mistakes in the math and get to the wrong answer sometimes. And it's not malicious intent. You just put a decimal in the wrong point or divide by the wrong thing or, and it could just be a, an, an honest error or whether it was bad data put out by all the rooms. I still don't know <laughs> what the answer is there. All I know is that, I mean, that's not what we're seeing in the, in our data. It's not what most of our other competitors in the data space are seeing. And it's not, I and mean, in talking with hosts and investors every day, which I do, it's not that what they're seeing in the data as well. So just trying to disprove that. And then just the whole housing collapse thing. So short-term rentals make up less than 1% of the overall housing stock. Most of the short-term rental inventory is actually people's second homes that they rent out occasionally and that aren't sort of bought for investment purposes. So just the whole premise that revenues are collapsing and that it's going to flood the housing market with inventory was just, I mean, seemed totally absurd to me and, and wanted to call it out. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that explanation. And uh, the whole 1% of the whole market is short-term rentals. Um, I follow an analyst, his name's Logan Motoshami, and he talks about this pretty consistently too. He's like, even if all the short-term rentals like sold, Mm -hmm. uh, we still wouldn't have regular inventory levels. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, it's not going to create a, even if everybody decided to list and sell at the same time, yep. we're still not going to have a housing collapse, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which and, is pretty telling. And, and we can say that overall, there are certain markets, like you go to a traditional vacation rental, the beach market that you're in right now, like if every single vacation home owner sold or tried to sell their house at the same time, like, yeah, that may cause a localized dynamic of collapsing home prices. But in most major MSAs and most even large, mid-sized, even small cities around the country, I and mean, it is less than half a percent of the overall housing stock. So, and that's where I mean, the vast majority of our, our housing stock is. Uh, definitely interesting points here. Um, kind of diving a little bit into the weeds here, if you will. I know you, you see a lot of data, a lot of different markets. Um, are there any specific markets that are perhaps you know, oversaturated or perhaps low demand that people should perhaps avoid if they're considering investing in the short-term rental space? And then like on the flip side, is there any ones they could, should you know, maybe take a look at? Yeah. I'm, something that's easy to call out in the data is markets that saw elevated performance because of non-typical trends that we saw during the pandemic. So a market like Coachella Valley, Joshua Tree, even like Cape Cod, where I have really I strong <laughs> peaks and troughs, peak seasons, off seasons, where we saw during 2021 and even into 2022, sort of non-typical trends of people staying in Joshua Tree throughout the entire summer because they wanted to get out, out of LA. Uh, people I'm traveling and working from their I'm houses in Cape Cod, sort of escaping the city and escaping Boston because they didn't want to sort of hang out in a city that was on lockdown or about to be locked down. So you saw homes earning revenues during periods that aren't typical. So if you're sort of diving into the trends and understanding, okay, like, yeah, it earned these revenues during the off season and in 2021 and 2022, but I shouldn't expect this going forward and can make the numbers work. Like, great. But to just look at the trailing 12 month revenue and say, this is sort of typical, that is sort of easily sort of disproven looking at sort of long-term time series in these markets. 
And so those are ones that I sort of I have seen a lot of supply growth as well. So Joshua Tree, Coachella Valley, Lake Tahoe, a lot of these markets that are sort of drive to from major MSAs. Uh, people and bought second homes during the pandemic, now starting to rent them out as they're sort of back in the city more. And those are sort of the poster childs around supply growth. Uh, Sevierville, Gatlinburg was another big one as well. And are now saw a lot of supply and, and occupancy has reverted more quickly in those markets. Uh, it's still important to say all those markets occupancy is still above 2018, 2019 levels. So it's not like a collapse happening. It's just coming off of the highs that we had seen. That makes a lot of sense. So it kind of sounds like for those markets, there's a lot of supply coming on because they're popular areas. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like the last two years have been kind of weird as we've been talking about the last few years, thanks to the pandemic. So really what, what people should maybe take away is if you're looking at those more popular markets, try to underwrite the off seasons as if it were perhaps a regular, normal off season, be conservative there. And perhaps if you maybe outperform, you get lucky, but like, you know, take a more conservative approach to underwriting during that time. Yep. And conversely, where we're seeing the opportunities is markets that people weren't necessarily wanting to move to during the pandemic. And we saw the massive sort of the great migration and was was very much hyped and led to and substantial increases in home values. But there's areas both within a city and certain cities that haven't seen the relative and as much of an increase in home values are still seeing great short-term rental demand. And there's different reasons why people move to different areas, want to live in an area versus travel to an area. And finding areas that, where we've still seen an uptick in revenues and occupancy in ADR and haven't seen the subsequent increase in, in home values, those are where we're seeing the best opportunities today. And that's actually where we're seeing the most supply growth today. So that's where investors are sort of migrating to. And broadly, we're still seeing revenues hold up. We're not seeing so much supply come in that it's sort of bringing it down right now. That's interesting. It's interesting to see that. With a lot of markets, uh, kind of shifting gears here a little bit, uh, with a lot of markets right now, we're seeing a lot of local regulation, right? A lot, so a lot of people who come to our world, they're always worrying about, are they going to try to close the tax benefits, right, of short-term rentals? And I'm always telling people, I don't believe so. I think the local markets will take care of it. Like, we'll start regulating it itself and kind of like do that. But anyway, um, the local markets, a lot of them have restrictions, bans, permitting processes, all different types of things are all right, we just saw Dallas recently ban short-term rentals in single-family markets. Do you see regulations continuing within certain markets? And how do you see that impacting short-term rental markets? Yeah. Overall, I see regulation as a great thing for the industry. I do not see bans of short-term rentals, obviously, as a great thing for the industry. So as an investor, when I'm looking at markets, I love to see regulation that they permit short-term rentals, that I can make an investment, pay my $100 registration fee, give them my name, give them my address and say, and they say, you know what? Like, we're happy about your investment. We're happy that you're going to be operating and bringing tourism dollars into the city. We're happy that you're going to be paying your transient occupancy tax and whatever that is for that city and state. Uh, and here's how you remit that payment. And it's a mutually beneficial relationship. And they depend on those tax revenues, and I can make my investment in that market. Broadly, that's what we see is happening in most markets around the country when regulation comes in. It's around permitting. It's around telling the city, the state, who you are, what phone number to call if there's a problem, et cetera, et cetera. And what the ordinances are, like you got to take your trash out. You can only have this many people parking at the residence any rules around noise, things like that, and just make sure the rules of the road are clear. And what is not great, obviously, is and when they go after sort of banning short-term rentals outright, like we've seen in, in Dallas, what we've effectively seen in, in New York now, uh, there's so many benefits to short-term rentals for markets and not only bringing in tourism dollars, but also of being an amenity for people in that city Midterm stays are such a big part of the short-term rental ecosystem now of people needing to live and work in a market, not willing to sign a one-year lease or not needing to sign and need sort of that in-between space. And students, interns, doctors, nurses, construction workers, there's all sorts of people now that need flexibility 
in housing and short-term rentals have really stepped in to be able to provide that. I definitely agree that that flat out bans are not great. And there's definitely certain needs for that. I know that I was I was thinking about traveling not too long ago and doing like the midterm rental thing. So it'd be sad to see that go in some markets for sure. So we, we've talked a lot on today's episode regarding short term rentals. Is there anything like any major insights or things that you're seeing that maybe we haven't touched on yet that would be useful for short term rental investors to know? I mean, one is just the the boom that's still happening outside of the major cities. So I'll admit, I had thought that this is going to be a, a temporary thing and not necessarily in the mountain or beach markets, but in the more rural, small cities around the country that really did see an uptick during the pandemic. And for obvious reasons, like you didn't want to travel to major cities, you weren't traveling overseas, you sort of spread out to the different areas that you were going to. And what has surprised me is that we're still seeing this happen. We're still seeing this as the fastest growing sort of demand segment in the industry. And one, it, it's great for investors because it sort of spreads out the type of markets you're going to. It's great for cities and that it's spreading out the destinations that people are all traveling to. It's not everyone going to New York or Miami or Paris or London. They're sort of going I'm up to upstate New York. They're going to... And to rural Kentucky, there and people are still traveling differently than they were pre-pandemic. And I see this as and just a great thing that's continuing on in the industry and and creating new spots for people to invest in and then continuing to spread out and where people are traveling to and it sort of solves some of those and sort of pre-pandemic and questions of how sustainable this industry was because of over tourism and everyone wanting to go to the same spots uh, and they're just becoming too crowded. And and especially as we sit here in sort of in peak travel season, August around the world is the time when most people are are getting out and traveling, not only spreading out the seasons that people are, are going to these destinations, but the types of cities is a great thing long term. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So if, if we had to summarize some key takeaways from this episode, uh, you know, correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong here, is that short-term rentals are not going anywhere. Still a lot of demand for short-term rentals by people who are traveling. However, uh, we've had a crazy market since the pandemic. And I think everybody is aware of that pretty much across the board, you know, financially and investments and what have you. Now it's more or less the short-term rental market starting to normalize. Um, and it's, we're not seeing crazy like um, deviations, I guess you could say, in what a normal short-term rental market uh, could be. So it's just more important that when you are doing your underwriting that you are aware that we are going to be normalizing. It isn't the wild, wild west. We're not going to see these crazy things that we've been seeing over the last few years. So just that shouldn't be the expectation for investors. Yeah, and that it's going to be an active investment. No matter what anyone told you, running a short-term rental is not passive. You are getting into the hospitality business. You're going to have guests checking in, checking out every week. Uh, you're going to have to monitor the data, monitor your competition. You're going to have to stay on top of the trends that are happening in your market to make sure you're competitive. And as long as you know that getting in, like you're going to do well. I want a refund. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody told me it was going to be work. Nobody says it's going to be passive. You go on TikTok and Instagram. That's what they say. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually have to talk to our clients about that relatively consistently. It's funny because... Yeah, we we put out. Um, I think early 2020, we put out a content. We, we actually we were putting out content on real estate professional status, and through that process, we discovered that short term rentals are accepted from Section 469, i.e., the short term rental loophole that everybody talks about now. But I think we were Bradford Tax is the only publication. I think maybe there was a tax advisor article or two out there on it at the time. Those are like the only two publications that really touched on it. So we started putting out a bunch of content on it. And then it like it just took off like wildfire. And now everybody's putting out content on it. And so now our clients, our new clients come to us and they're like, we know all about the short-term rental loophole and we're going to use the short-term rental loophole. And like our tax advisory now is like, almost talking them out of it <laughs> it's like it's like well okay yes you could do this but you are getting in the hospitality business and i hate to break it to you but your emails are not very hospitable <laughs> the way that you phrase things it's not very nice like you're not going to get these five-star reviews <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, but it's just, it's a really good reminder. You really, you have to understand that you are getting into a service business. And uh, if you don't know what that looks like, go onto Facebook. There's plenty of short-term rental groups where, you know, somebody will get a complaint and they'll kind of like draft their reply in Facebook to get feedback on. And those replies are like just nasty replies, you know, (laughs) coming from the host. And uh, you just, you're getting into hospitality. You're going to take bumps and bruises and you have to learn how to manage it. And if you're not willing to do that, or if you don't want that extra stressor on your life, then don't jump into short-term rentals, no matter what the tax benefits are. That's effectively what we tell people. Like I love my beach house and I self-manage it. And I would buy 15 more because the return is amazing. But all the problems happen at 10.30 p.m. on Sunday. (laughs) Okay, It's not like I can batch all of the time that I spend on a Friday afternoon. If I could do that, I'd buy 15 more of these things. But like, it doesn't work like that. So it's like in the middle of a movie with my wife, you know, winding down and then bam, HVAC's out. It's like, okay, now I got to go troubleshoot this, right? So it's just but, different. But as you know, as well, 99% of guests are great. It's just that oh, 1% yeah. that... <laughs> well, that's the other thing, right? It's like, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have 19 weeks of just pure perfection and bliss. And then that one week, it's just bam, 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 bam. And then you're sitting there questioning... The entire thing. I actually read a book recently that Tom gave me called The Gap in the Game or The Gain in the Gap. I don't know if I messed that up. The Gap in the Game. The Gap in the Game. Gap in the Game. Yeah. It's actually helped me rephrase that whole thing because when I when that one bad week comes, I lose my mind. I'm just like, dude, I run a CPA firm. I'm already too busy. I can't like deal with it. Yeah. But now I'm like going, okay, well, wait a second. I had 19 amazing weeks. So this one week, I'll put up with it. It's fine. Yeah, uh, but anyway, that that book kind of helped me. <laughs> and then you, you think yeah. of what you would have paid for a property manager, and like, all right, like one. That's right. One, yeah, <laughs> one yeah. night of a few hours of work, like uh, that's worth my time. Yeah, it is funny though because every time that that bad thing happens, I will go and like start pricing out local property managers, and I'm like, okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think we covered a lot today. I think we're going to wind down here. Jamie, if people want to learn more about Air DNA or want to learn more about you, what would be the best avenues for them to do so? Yeah. Um, definitely head to our website, airdna.co. If you want to follow along with some of the research I do, go to our blog. We put out regular updates on industry performance. Uh, we have our own podcast called the STR Data Lab, where we talk all data all the time. And then you can follow me on Twitter at Jamie underscore Lane if you want to follow that way. All right, awesome. So we're going to go ahead and drop that into the show notes uh, below for everybody who's listening and wants to check that out. Jamie, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today again um, and sharing uh, your knowledge and wisdom with our listeners. And for for all the short-term rental investors out there or people who are considering getting into the game, just do remember what we just talked about in this last part of the episode. <laughs> it is an active business. You don't want someone, uh, if you're not ready to be in an active business and you want it to be passive, it might not be the best decision for you. And that's why you should not let the tax tail wag the dog if you're making it just for tax decisions. So just, just know that it is a business. It's not something passive. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Thank you guys.